You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well, I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3, right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mr. The answer is level three or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Pettersen, John Pettersen. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Pettersen? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. The maximum class size is twelve. But I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Pettersen. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus. Comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you, as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Pettersen. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six. Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheid, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary, not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five-acre or two-hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. 
In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space, once again more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10am and 4.30pm. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9am and 5.30pm. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats. At 11am, 2pm and 3.45pm, there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard, suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself, what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science? This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. 
You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the Dean of Academic Affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now, some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen.、Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read, although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm, let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes. There was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a conversation between two students about studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hey Mary, how's school going? Haven't seen you in a while. What have you been up to? John, good to see you again. I've been really busy the last couple of weeks. I'm applying to study abroad next year. Really? So am I. I think it will be a great experience to be able to study in another country. What country do you want to go to? At first I wanted to study in Africa, but my parents really don't want me to go there because they think it will be dangerous. So now I'm thinking about going to Spain, Italy or Japan. Actually, I think Africa would be a fascinating place. I would want to go there to visit. Maybe not to study, but definitely I would want to go visit. For next year, I want to go to either China or Germany to study, but my parents can't afford any European countries, so maybe... Why China or Germany? Well, I want to go to China because I think it's a really interesting country with a long history. Plus, it has been changing so much, and I think it is a great time to be there. I really want to improve my Chinese also, and I've been taking Mandarin courses the last two semesters. I would want to go to Germany because my mother is German and I want to learn more about my cultural background. How about you? Why the countries you chose? Well, I want to go to a Spanish-speaking country. I took Spanish in high school, so I figure if I go to a Spanish-speaking country, I'll be better off knowing some of the language already. But I have already been to Mexico many times and South American countries don't have classes for my major, except for Brazil but they mostly speak Portuguese there. I would want to go to Italy because I want to do a study about ancient Roman civilization. It has always been a dream of mine to go and see Pompeii and the volcanic ruins. Plus, my family has Italian roots and I love Italian food. I want to go to Japan mainly because my girlfriend was born in Japan and always tells me all of these fascinating stories about Japanese history and culture. I am a big fan of sumo wrestling also, so I've always wanted to see a sumo match in person. I really love sushi and almost all Japanese food. Recently, I have started to watch some Japanese baseball too. But of course, these are all secondary reasons. My main reason is of course my girlfriend and understanding her culture. I don't speak any Japanese though, so that is my major drawback. I think it is much better to go to a country if you can speak the language. That's great. When do you have to decide by? I have to finish all my applications this week. I'm really stressed trying to finish everything, on top of all my schoolwork. I'm almost done with my applications. I just have to finish the Italy application. I think my last choice is Italy, so I'm doing that one last. How long do you want to go for? I think I'm only going to go abroad for one semester, or else I won't be able to graduate on time. I have many classes left until I can finish my degree, and I'm not sure if I will be able to take them studying out of the country. I think I might be able to study in Spain because my Spanish is fluent, but definitely not in Italy or Japan, unless they have classes offered in English. I want to go for a year. I've heard that it's better to go for a year because you get a fuller experience and get a better grasp on the language. But I understand that most people can't finish their degree in time. It was hard trying to decide which country I would rather go to, but I think my first choice is to go to China. I know Germany will be great also. Either way, I will be thrilled to have the opportunity to study there. What's your first choice? I really don't have one. Actually, I think I'm like you. Just being able to study in another country will be great. Either Japan or Spain will be awesome. Italy will be awesome too. But I've been there a bunch of times, so I think I prefer to go somewhere else. Sounds exciting. We'll have to go to class now. It was great talking to you again. See you around next time? Yeah, sure. See you around. Hope that everything goes well. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.